We need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad. I'm Donna Gilmore. I'm the founder of the <laughs> thank you, uh, San Onofre Safety .org website. Well, what? Okay, so I'm kind of new at this stuff. So um, yeah, I'm a um, little a few months before Fukushima, I was sitting in my backyard in San Clemente and oblivious to all what was going on. And I read in the local paper that employees at the plant were being uh, fired for reporting safety problems. Uh, so after investigating, I found out not only was that happening, but we don't have a lot of time, so I'll cut to this. San Onofre has more safety complaints from employees to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission than any other plant in the entire nation. You can see the red lines uh, over, yeah. over there is San, San Onofre, and that's all the rest of them, you know, the blue lines for the rest of the plants. And they also have the highest rate of retaliating against employees that report safety problems. Okay. And this data comes directly from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission website. Uh, one of the whistleblowers showed me how to read their what they call safety allegation statistics. And this is like a six year period and it continues today. Um, and then there, there's a chart for their steam generators that looks pretty similar to this. They have like the worst steam generators too. So, but that's a whole nother, we need another day for that. Um, and now we're relying on Southern California Edison to manage the tons of waste that's sitting at the plant. After the plant closed, um, I started researching the waste. And what I found out is, I didn't think I could be shocked anymore. San Onofre chose to use a fuel that is over twice as radioactive and unstable in storage and unpredictable. It takes going to take at least 15 years to cool in the what they call spent fuel pools before it's cool enough to move to a dry container. However, I also learned that the even the NRC will not approve a, a container, a dry cask for this for this what they call high burn-up fuel because it burns burns longer in the reactor. Uh, because they don't trust it will last l longer than 20 years in the dry container. Uh, this stuff is um, uh, this high burn-up fuel. It's a fuel that, that can burn longer in the reactor, which makes Edison more money but makes us less safe. Um, it's breaking the protective cladding around the uranium pellets. It's cracking, and if that cracks, it can release radiation into the environment. And if any oxygen gets in those dry containers, gets in the dry containers, um, we can have a hydrogen explosion in, in a dry cask down there. And we've got, uh, you know, how, how many more times of, uh, than Chernobyl? times the amount of radiation that we, we stored 19 times the amount of radiation that was released in Chernobyl accident right here in San Onofre. Yeah. And, and there's no, so people are wanting to get this stuff out of here. Well, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will not approve a transportation container because the protective cladding over the uranium is becoming fragile and it might shatter if they move the stuff. So we're kind of stuck. So, so what is the nuclear industry? What is San Onofre? What is the NRC doing about this? Uh, not much. They're not doing anything that's going to help. Um, so I, I uh, collaborated with a nuclear physicist and we put together a, a paper on the, on the problem in more details and we have some 
uh, suggestions uh, for what we can do um, to improve this. But from what I've learned um, in all my research is, is we're in an environment where profit is, is prioritized over safety. And this you know, goes all the way up. Uh, so unless we get citizen involvement to, to, to flip that, so we have safety over um, profits, um, you know, we're, we're going to be the next Fukushima, even though those reactors are not running. It, it's that serious. It's a question? Yes. You mentioned this Hibernum fuel. Hibernum fuel. Hibernum. How is that different than, uh, from MOX? Uh, well, MOX can be Hibernum. MOX, MOX is very dangerous also. They're not using that at the plant. Uh, a Hibernum fuel is uh, low enriched uranium. They take the uranium and they add up to 5% of uranium-235 to it. And by doing that, uh, you can use the fuel uh, longer. You can burn it longer in the reactor before you have to take it out and treat it as spent fuel. MOX has plutonium in it. Okay, so that's, that's the difference. That's extremely dangerous. Uh, no, but it eventually will create yes. plutonium at some point. So uh, now, um, yeah, it, there's, a uh, there's a technical term they use. Uh, the, the NRC currently defines high burn-up is fuel that um, has, um, uh, let me see, has produced, what is it, over, 40, over 45 gigawatt days per metric ton of uranium. Anyway, so it's a you know, kind of a convoluted measurement. But in actuality, the Department of Energy, Energy has reports that fuel that has burn up as low as 30 gigawatt days um, is showing the same signs. And the fuel at San Onofre, it's all over, it's all pretty much over 40 um, is what they have there, except for this stuff that uh, just recently came out of Unit 2 that they had loaded in anticipating a restarting and they didn't get to do that. Question? Yes, yeah, so you can actually, I've kind of got it set up so you can either read the cliff notes or the long version, okay? So if you go to the home page, sananofreesafety.org, um, it, it'll give you the highlights of not only this issue, but a, a number of other really important issues. And then you can, and I actually have a, a nuclear waste page that goes into this and a number of other things that, you know, they're, you know it's kind of late and I don't want to um, wear people out, but this is, this is a critical issue and I've found myself in an odd situation that I'm actually educating um, nuclear engineers on this. The, um, they were misled, let's say, years ago that the only difference between high burn-up fuel and lower burn-up fuel was it just has to cool longer before you can put it in dry cask. And that's, and that's not true. And, and they knew it wasn't, wasn't true, but for some reason um, they, di they didn't understand that. So, so every document on my website has links to either an NRC document or a government or scientific report backing up all the facts that I, ha that I have. And I've got copies of the NRC document where they're not approving more than 20 years of dry storage, where they're not approving, approving transportation studies and, and charts. There's a chart showing the higher the burn up, the more high, hydrides get created and the more hydrides, you know, the higher the risk of a, of a hydrogen explosion like you saw at Fukushima. Um, and if any oxygen gets to that, and the, those, ca those canisters that they put it in they're made out of stainless steel, and the, the, uh, there's a, a worker at the plant that used to run the shop that manufactured those, and he says this marine environment, well, you know what it does to metals, we live here, um, it, you know, is affecting the metals and affecting the, the welds. Um, so if, if that containment is breached in the, in the canister and, and the, the cladding has failed, uh, then, then those casts will just explode right there, and that radiation will go everywhere. So, so it's very important to get involved in. Question? So you all know about Dr. Helen Caldicott. Yes, I know about Helen Caldicott. She's the on on high burn up. 
Oh, on nuclear reactors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, she is. And, and it's important to share this information and to learn more. Um, the, re the report that was uh, uh, done with uh, Dr. Marvin Reznikoff, um, that's been presented to the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, uh, to some se um, Senate staff, so, so we've got some different action items going and some recommendations. The industry, their idea of solving the problems is let's stick some high burn up fuel in a canister that was not even approved for it and we'll just watch and prove to you that everything's hunky dory and that's their plan. That's the plan. So they have no other plan for long-term Well, and, and the, the other problem, the other, the other problem is uh, they don't even consider options if it's going to cost them too much money. So that's the other thing that has to change, but that's not going to change without, you know, pressure from, uh, from, from, from people here and other places. Uh, I've also found that the people that are in power that can do something about this are totally ignorant of this issue. Um, and you know, I, I spoke to uh, uh, the CPUC Commissioner Florio. He'd never heard the, the term high burn up. Uh, PG&E tried to lie about it um, um, and, and got caught. I read their document and. and uh, and now, and now San Onofre is trying to approve a new model dry cast that's even going to be more dangerous to put it in. So we can't trust them to do it right. We can't trust the NRC to watch it. So we need something similar to what we did to get San Onofre shut down. Now we had a, to get San Onofre shut down, we had Friends of the Earth involved. They had a generous donation from uh, somebody in, uh, in Laguna Beach, so we, we need to thank whoever that was in Laguna Beach for making the difference because if there was no money to pay for those lawyers to, to, to take legal action against our own government, that, that plant may have, uh, may have restarted. So it, so it, took, a t it took a team effort and, and, and that, uh, you know, and that too. And then the, we, we went to local city councils, we educated city councils, we educated state level, we educated Barbara Boxer. Um, and, um, and so through, through this process, putting it all together, um, it, you know, the, the plant was shut down. But without, without the money for the lawyers, you know, it wouldn't happen. I, I recommend that you go to the website and get educated if there is a point, uh, and if you, if you follow it, I, I don't do many postings on it because I know everybody's busy and they have a lot of other things to do. So, so if there's something significant event, it'll get posted there. And, and Gary also has a, um, a list where he'll send things out for, uh, for events with his San Clemente Green. So you can sign up and get those. It's, it's not a whole lot of emails, it's just significant things. But it's important, you know, you, you care enough to show up. How many of you knew that San Onofre had the worst safety record Quite a few. Okay, so so that's good. So anyway, so we're counting on them, and they're not going to do it. So it's up to us. We've got another big battle here, and I'm going to be optimistic. It's um, winnable, but at the same night time, I'm not going to remodel my house yet. So. <laughs> so uh, do you have sure. any more? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Donna. Okay. Well, my name's Gary Hedrick, and as you know, San Clemente Green is what Lori and I started, not knowing where it might end up back in 2007, but um, here we are, humbled to be part of this group, and Donna and Harvey and Ace and Sharon out there, people that have dedicated so much time, and Darren working behind the scenes. So many people come together to make this whole package what it is, and I think there's so many people I wish I could recognize, but they're not here. And first of all, the one that comes to my mind and heart is the whistleblowers that had the balls to stand up in public and call these guys out and tell them what's really going on so we would become aware. I know they got my attention, and uh, it's never, never been anything I regretted. Looking back on it, I'm so glad to be part of this movement, 
And I think just on a personal level, what is so amazing is not just the bonds that occur with people that you work day by day, side by side with. It's like tonight, looking across the ocean towards Japan and thinking of all the people we've met here from Japan and knowing what they've gone through and being at, uh, at the LA embassy and yelling, Saikido Hantai, and being right with them, you know, and understanding and feeling it and seeing what's going on in Japan is so inspiring. And, and then to have visitors come from Japan and saying they, they're concerned for us because we're potentially the next ones to have to endure that. And it's just, uh, it's humbling. And at the same time, it gives me so much hope because there are technical problems and there's money problems and there's almost insurmountable problems except for the power of love, you know? And that's really what gives me hope that we're gonna overcome not just the nuclear power issues, but climate change and, you know, getting reasonable governance and, uh, a better system, you know, because this system is not sustainable for so many reasons, and it's so bad, the only way it can be altered is a beautiful transition to a whole new world. And uh, I'm just glad to see the transition. This is the beginning of something beautiful, and it begins with just ordinary people like Lori and myself that uh, couldn't turn our backs on the situation. And once you open up, you start realizing, gosh, you know, I could stand in front of people and talk or go to city councils or <laughs> confront Edison face to face. Or, you know, you discover these things that you didn't know you had powers like that. And when you have that combined experience with everyone, uh, it's just unstoppable. I'm so hopeful for the future and uh, together we can do it. We've seen it here and we can see it other places too. Diablo Canyon's next. So that's all I've got, thanks. I think this well, it's an honor to uh, uh, follow you guys. Uh, it, I, I'm sure everybody's aware. I'm Harvey, by the way, and uh, I'm eating chips because I fasted today and I missed dinner. So, <laughs> um, uh, although getting down here from Los Angeles was not fast, I live in Ohio, and uh, traffic has a whole other meaning in Southern California. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, but it's an honor to be with you guys, and I hope everybody understands how hugely significant the deactivation of the San Onofre reactors really is. It's a, a tremendous step forward in the history of the human race. And I don't overstate that when I say that. It's very, very hard to do, to shut down uh, commercial reactors. Um, but we are now at 100 in this country. This is my 41st year working at this. Uh, in 1973, uh, a nuclear company came into a town in Massachusetts where I was living. We had an organic farm. And uh, we vowed to stop them from building it. And today, you can go where they were going to build it. The, the bulldozers never came in. And you can lie down on the grass and look up at the sky and think this would have been two reactors. And now you can drive by San Onofre and see three shut power plants. We have a huge waste issue. But it is a huge deal. So as they say, mazel tov to all of you. Congratulations. It's a, it's a tremendous victory. And it means a tremendous amount. Now, uh, today, um, as mentioned, I do a lot of writing about Fukushima. Um, I, was, uh, I work at night, late at night, and uh, one of the reasons I work late at night is because I never get phone calls. And um, I go till about three in the morning usually, and at two in the morning on March 11th, three years ago, I got a call. And the guy asked me, my friend David asked me to turn on CNN, and there it was. And uh, you know, our lives have been um, not the same ever since. And I think well, most of us understand the gravity of the situation, but I want to say a, a couple of things. First of all, um, to all those out there who say that no one will be harmed by Fukushima, uh, um, it is the biggest lie ever told. Um, I went into central Pennsylvania. Uh, it was nice to see Eric up there um, in the, the year after the accident uh, at Three Mile Island. And I interviewed uh, dozens of people it was the worst time I ever spent in my life. Uh, uh, cancer, leukemia, birth defects, stillbirths, malformations, uh, open sores, loss of hair, metallic taste in the mouth, animals that couldn't breed. <clears throat> it was like being in a, in a science fiction film, a very bad science fiction film. And yet the industry still persists in saying that no one was killed at Three Mile Island. It's a horrible lie. 
They see not enough radiation escape from Three Mile Island to harm anybody. They don't know how much radiation escaped. They will never know how much radiation escaped. All the monitors went off scale during Three Mile Island. They, they had a, a thermoluminescent dosimeters which measure radiation where it goes, and there was one um, that went off scale exactly where it was expected in the northwest quadrant where the wind was blowing, and the industry said it was a defective monitor and it didn't mean anything. Uh, that's what the industry does. If you push a button and they have a major disaster, the instant response is always the same. Not enough radiation escaped to harm anybody. That's what they said about Chernobyl. That's what they're saying about Fukushima. And that's what they'll say about the next accident and the accident after that. We, and WIP as, and WIP as well, yes. And let me give you a little, a quick history here. Um, starting with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the military said that when people started losing their hair and, and all the other horrible things that happened, the military said, well, there's no such thing as radiation. What are you talking about? And then they had to fess up that there, there was radiation in it, which the scientists knew, of course. The scientists who made the atomic bomb circulated a petition. 80% of the scientists in the Manhattan Project asked the military to drop the bombs in uninhabited areas so that they would demonstrate to the Japanese what we have and not kill all these people. But of course, the, Jap the, the military went ahead and did that. They bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, by the way, because those were two of the four cities we deliberately did not bomb so they could test the impact of the bombs from, with aerial photographs. To, to this day, the, 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 tests in, the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are referred to as announced nuclear tests. Right. And they denied that anybody would have any health effects at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Then they denied that there would be any health effects from the bombings in the South Pacific, the atomic tests that were conducted in the Marshall Islands, especially at Bikini. At Bikini this is the 60th anniversary, March 1st, 1954, the Castle Bravo uh, test. They blew up Bikini. It was twice. It went off twice as powerful as they thought. The wind shifted direction, and a, an un unfortunate ship, the Lucky Dragon, was completely con uh, contaminated. Uh, six of the 23 crew, crew members eventually died of liver cancer. And the, the chief of the Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss, accused them of being communists and trying to make the Americans look bad. <laughs> because they went and died of liver cancer. What a, that's a communist plot. Uh, uh, Louis, Louis, Strauss is, Louis Strauss is the same guy that said nuclear power will be too cheap to meter. Then, and this is the killer, and this is the one thing you need to always remember when you're debating someone from the nuclear industry. In 1956, Dr. Alice Stewart, who was not looking for anything resembling radiation, found in a, in a survey she was doing that uh, a, a women who are x-rayed during pregnancy, their offspring will have a doubled childhood leukemia rate. Now this is the, this is the, the she was attacked, she was crucified, she was pilloried, she was blacklisted, you name it, for 30 years. Now, I, met, I met Dr. Stewart, she was in the, <laughs> didn't mess with Alice Stewart, she was an amazing woman, she stood her ground, and then after 30 years in the 1980s, the medical profession finally said, well, maybe we shouldn't really x-ray pregnant women anymore. And, and, uh, and you know, they, and, and maybe when you go have a dental x-ray, you might want to put on a bib. And maybe x-ray technicians should leave the room when they do this day after day after day. The bottom line is there is no safe dose of radiation. There is no dose of radiation that can be shown that it will not harm an embryo or a fetus in utero. There's no such thing. There's no number. And this has been proven time and time again. So when you have these people running around saying, Fukushima is the equivalent of eating a banana. We've seen that in this, this ridiculous movie, Pandora's Promise. It's the equivalent of eating banana. It's like flying from New York to Los Angeles. It's like living in Denver. It's utter nonsense. Radiation kills people. Many, many, many people will die as a result of Fukushima. There is absolutely no doubt about it. We have a study that indicates these three Russian scientists surveyed 5,000 studies that were done about Chernobyl and came to the conclusion years ago, this is years ago, that 985,000 people would die from, from the Chernobyl disaster. And so now we're, we're in, and, and you know, I'm in this combat every day, all of you are, about the, the health effects of radiation. Uh, the health effects of radiation are unknown 
They cannot be known. The science is, is imprecise, but there is more radiation coming out of Fukushima than we would ever, ever want to con contemplate uh, uh, introducing into our natural environment. 300 tons a day of highly radioactive water every day for in perpetuity are coming through the Fukushima site. What do we have at Fukushima? We have three melted cores that they don't know where they are. If I had described, or any of you had described, to an audience of nuclear engineers what happened at Fukushima on March 10th, 2011, they would have thrown you out of the room, they would have laughed at you, they would have said, you're not credible. If we had des described what happened at Chernobyl the day before, on April 25th, 1986, they would have laughed you out of the room. And I heard this from 1973 on, the nuclear industry repeatedly saying, like a mantra, a nuclear, a commercial reactor cannot explode. A commercial reactor cannot explode. A commercial reactor cannot explode. And anyone who dared say that in public, that one could explode, they were deemed as not credible, discredited, you name it. Well, we, now we've had five of them that have exploded. Five commercial reactors have exploded on this planet. The one at Fukushima, I'm, I'm sorry, the one at Chernobyl, when, when Chernobyl exploded, they said, oh, that's not relevant, that's that old Soviet technology, that has nothing to do with the rest of the industry. Come on. And now, of course, now these, these four reactors that have blown up, three meltdowns, four hydrogen explosions, these are general electric reactors. These are American commercial atomic power plants. There are 31 Mark I and Mark II general electric reactors in the United States. The containment domes on these plants are paper mache, basically, and the geniuses that built these plants put the spent fuel pools up in the air outside the containment domes, 100 feet in the air. And let me tell you something else. I was in Japan in the mid-1970s. I marched with the anti-nuclear movement. We showed them movies, I, a lot of dialogue. I wrote an article for the Progressive Magazine that was published in 1977 that talked about Fukushima and said, the people of Japan cannot believe that the nuclear power industry would build commercial reactors in an earthquake tsunami zone, like the Apo Canyon, for example. But we don't talk about the American ones, right? Um, uh, and by the way, I did uh, three lovely nights in the county jail in San Luis Obispo in 1984. I highly recommend it. Food's not, <laughs> food's not very good. The, 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 the orange, orange um, uh, polyester, just not my color, but um, very nice people there. It's very comfortable, and you'll have a good time when we go back up there. But uh, nonetheless, they were warned. They were told repeatedly, do not build nuclear power plants in earthquake zones washed by tsunamis. And it's worse than that. There was, if you look at photographs of Fukushima before the site was built, before the reactors were built, it's hard for me to say this. There was an 85-foot high natural seawall at Fukushima. Units five and six are up in the air. That's why they didn't get. That's why they didn't explore. They weren't operating at the time. But they weren't. As, they could have possibly turned them back on. They they weren't severely damaged. Had they been operating at the time, there would have been a lot of problems. But the f units one, two, three, and four, they took down the seawall. There was a mount, an 85-foot high hill there going down into the sea. Why? Well, they didn't want to have to pump the water all the way up, and they didn't want to have to unload the, uh, the, the components of the reactors and move them up the hill, so they removed the hill. And then they say, well, we couldn't have expected what happened there. Come on. Then, to top that off, they, built the, they put the backup generators, the backup power generators, in the basement <laughs> below sea level. For God's sakes, what, who is surprised? Not only did the tsunami wipe out the, the backup steam generators, but it made it, backup power generators, it made it impossible to ruin the connections. So when they came in with backup backup, you know, brought them in by trucks, or my favorite, they went out in the uh, parking lot and, and um, uh, ransacked automobiles and trucks to take car batteries out to bring into the nuclear power plant. That's how desperate they were. Um, but they ruined the connections. So that when the, when the tsunami came in, in this below sea level basement, they couldn't plug anything in because it was all destroyed by the, by the tsunami. And they say they couldn't predict this. Totally predictable. Now there's a core problem here, and I'll, I won't go on much longer. The core problem is that these are private corporations. TEPCO, which per, the perpetrators of this global post-apocalyptic disaster, is a private corporation. 
There is one goal and one goal only in the corporate charter of TEPCO, and that is to make money. Now, we circulated a petition um, asking that the global community be, take over at Fukushima so that all the world's scientific and financial resources would be available to deal with the Fukushima crisis. We got 150,000 signatures. We delivered them to the United Nations on November 7th. You know what we heard? Nothing. We've heard nothing, not from the Secretary General, not from TEPCO, not from the, from the Japanese government. But the fact of the matter is that TEPCO, like every utility company in the United States, has no financial liability for any of the damage that they do. It is not in the interest of PG&E or any other corporation that owns a nuclear power plant to protect the public safety because there's no money in it. God forbid Diablo Canyon, and by the way, Fukushima is not a worst case scenario. It is, by, it is way, way far, way short of a worst case scenario. A worst case scenario is that that, that, that 9.0 Richter scale earthquake that was 100 miles offshore was one mile offshore or right under Fukushima or right under Diablo Canyon or right under Indian Point, for God's sakes, 35 miles north of New York City. Then what you get is a rubble a pile of radioactive rubble with multiple meltdowns, hydrogen explosions, possibly fission explosions. And by the way, we're not 100% sure that there wasn't a fission explosion in Unit 3 at Fukushima. It's quite possible. If you look at the cloud, it, might, it may have happened at Chernobyl too. So not only can reactors explode, but they may actually fission and have that problem as well. But nonetheless, TEPCO um, is not in any way, shape, or form incentivized to protect the public safety. No one from, from TEPCO has been prosecuted for this, uh, as no one was at Three Mile Island. Chernobyl may be a little different. But, um, uh, and in every case, by the way, not only was the public misinformed at Three Mile Island, at Chernobyl, and at TEPCO, uh, at uh, Fukushima, the governments were misinformed. The President of the United States was lied to by the operators of Three Mile Island. Gorbachev was lied to by the operators of Chernobyl, and certainly not Okan, was lied to by TEPCO repeatedly throughout this disaster. So the bottom line for these guys is this at TEPCO. The cleanup of Fukushima, such as it is, is a profit center. They are making money playing at cleaning up uh, the, 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 the site there. Some of the most powerful footage in this film was dealing with the workers there. They didn't really talk about organized crime. But Reuters ran two very powerful um, uh, articles uh, documenting that the, 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 wor the workforce at, at, uh, at Fukushima, as was at many of the commercial reactor sites in the United States when these plants were being built, is dominated by organized crime. When you get that many people working on a, on a tight site with tons of money around, you're going to have the mafia in there. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's a totally corrupt situation. There is no incentive to clean up Fukushima. Just like there was none, at, you know, they're not even done. I'm almost done. They're, they're, almost, they're not even finished at Chernobyl. You know, we just had this, uh, whatever it was in Ukraine. They're not done putting the sarcophagus uh, over, over Chernobyl. Who's going to finish that job? So the bottom line is this. Uh, uh, TEPCO had an, an extremely profitable year last year. After all they did to the planet, TEPCO made over $8 billion last year in profits. So what we have to do is do what was done here at San Onofre and do it damn quick. We shut four reactors last year, four commercial reactors. We went down from 104 to 100. We're, um, uh, Exelon says they're going to uh, shut five more. But we are all, this year, but we're all living in absolute terror from any one of these commercial reactors. And the good news is, and I'll finish with this, we are in the midst of a technological revolution, unprecedented in human history. Photovoltaic cells will be the biggest industry in the history of the world. Every building, every home, every office, every vehicle, every machine, every handheld device will have photovoltaic cells to convert sunlight to electricity, every one of them. Windmills, uh, so, um, uh, biofuels, uh, um, uh, ocean thermal, geothermal, all these technologies have exploded. Just watch any documentary uh, film with Amory Levins in it and you'll understand what's happening here. What's standing in the way of our survival on this planet and of our prosperity as a species is nuclear power. You guys have shown that, uh, 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 you men and women have shown that uh, nuclear power plants, however big and however well funded with however big a utility behind them, can be shut down. 
And now we have to duplicate that all over the world. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. And let's have a question. Congratulations, you have completed this video with flying colors. Please await your certificate and complimentary fruit basket in the mail before proceeding any further.